Okay. Okay, and uh, I'm going to the next slide. Yes, and just to be super clear what we're gonna do today here and for who we are doing that. Uh, of course, you all can benefit from this session, but originally it is designed for everyone who is working in an L&D sphere. It doesn't matter if you're new to it or uh, you are a go-to expert. Uh, you can also benefit from that if you are generally interested in learning analytics or if you're already building your online courses, uh, either you are accountable for that or responsible for. And of course, the main objective of today's workshop is to find new ideas, find inspiration, brainstorm together, try to find some solutions to challenges, to talk to each other, to build cool connections in our field, and obviously to have fun. Cool. Uh, yes, sorry, I, I was reading Kelly's message uh, and we, we're going to have just two minutes for a small introduction of who you are. Please write in the chat or uh, talk to us now. Yes. <laughs> uh, where are you from? In which sphere you're working? From which country or city are you connected today? Okay, I can start. Uh, oh, yes. yeah, go <laughs> ahead. Go ahead. I'll follow you. Yeah. Okay. So I'm Asha. I'm uh, yeah. I'm Berlin, and uh, I'm representing the uh, like LMS uh, systems. Uh, like I'm working in the Ninja One, the company which is uh, creating the IT software for IT technicians, and I'm uh, taking the role of uh, preparing the trainings, onboardings, and any further trainings for my um, team. And we are working with another like tool, Workramp. Um, but I'm happy to know about like any other things which can be correlated and um, be used um, in these systems. Cool. cool. Such an international team today. London, yeah. Czech Republic, oh, Berlin. Nice. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Zlata. I'm an LMB expert. And today I'm connecting, I'm actually based in Kyiv, but today I'm connecting from Portugal. I'm on a workation here. And um, my current L&D project is leading a community of practice of Ukrainian early childhood educators and practical psychologists in creating courses on mental health and psychological well-being, uh, trauma-informed practices and social emotional learning for um, early childhood educators uh, in the context of war and forced displacement. I'm uh, super happy to be here today. Thanks for this event. Nice, very interesting. And having the vacation in Portugal, it's <laughs> cool. Oh, that's the best place to be. <laughs> that's the best part of that, for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah, you very I can... much. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. I thought I would just quickly jump in and now go back to my sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi everyone i'm kelly um right now i'm based in berlin i mean i've been in berlin for um, six and a half years now um my previous role is also how i got to know olga um was in learning and development at a health tech company and lately i just changed my job and right now i'm working um at a people enablement platform that's called leapsum i don't know if you're aware of and um, i'm being the cs enablement manager so basically doing R&D, um, but mm -hmm. more specifically for the CS team right now. So nice to meet you all. Cool. Nice to meet you, Kelly. Cool, cool, cool. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, actually, it's interesting because uh, we have people from Kiev, from people who connect from Portugal, from Berlin. Uh, so the day before yesterday, I arrived from Portugal to Berlin. And tonight I'm going to Kiev. So everything is connected. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, oh, Anya. 
Yeah, let's get started. Uh, since this session is about learning, evaluation, analysis, data, uh, I was just wondering how do you feel about this topic? Feel free to select one of these four options or add your own option uh, and a short explanation why you feel this way. You can drop your message in the chat or just unmute yourself and share your feelings. When uh, we realized that we have to implement analytics dashboard uh, on our academy, we were <laughs> like C. <laughs> but when we finally did it, we were like B. Uh, but uh, uh, as more as we see the metrics that we still have to implement, we are like A. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel after using your analytics like D, actually. Uh, so... <laughs> I think you're being very modest, Olga. Um, <laughs> so I see in the chat it's B, nice. C, I can relate to that sometimes. Um, A, absolutely, yeah. Sometimes I feel like that B plus C, so quite a mix, or A plus B. Yeah, quite a mix of feelings here. And unfortunately, no one is feeling like D. Mm -hmm. uh, but I hope that all of us will feel like D after this session. Uh, okay, then let's get started. Uh, yeah. So why do we need to evaluate learning? And by learning, I mean any training, any learning project in the organization. Why do we need to do that? I'm pretty sure everyone has their own list of reasons why we need to do that. Uh, but I came up with three main ones and feel free to add your own reasons or goals to the chat because uh, it's a space to collaborate and I don't want to be the one doing all the talking all the time. Uh, so number one reason to evaluate learning projects is to measure the project value for the organization. So basically, if I launch a sales training or I launch an, or on, an onboarding, I want to know that this was useful for the organization it was launched for. And without evaluation, it is very hard to prove that this was actually useful. Uh, otherwise, it's just an opinion. Uh, so second reason uh, is to identify areas of improvement and make informed decisions. Basically, if I launch, again, a sales training, I want to know what worked in this sales training and what didn't work. And if I don't have the data, if I don't have the analytics, it is very hard to pinpoint solutions that worked and solutions that I should get rid of. And finally, the third reason is to prove our value as L&D function to the organization. You know, now, uh, with all these layoffs and a lot happening in the world, uh, it is hard sometimes for business functions to prove their value. And I think for L&D, it is especially hard because learning is hard to isolate. It is very difficult to say that this is exactly, this was improved exactly due to learning and not due to some other changes. So doing evaluation systematically and strategically actually gives us the data and gives us this power to show to the business leaders that business has improved and is doing better because of the L&D initiatives and not due to something else. So these are my three main reasons to evaluate learning. If you feel that there are more reasons to do this, feel free to put them in the chat. And we can move on to the next slide. So what exactly do I mean when I'm saying learning evaluation? Um, by that, I mean deriving insights from the data that we have to make decisions afterwards or to showcase this data. Uh, and this means that we need the data. And by data, there is also a lot uh, to be said about it. Uh, usually by data, what is meant is numbers. So the net promoter scores, completion rates, assessment scores, all sorts of meaningful and informative and not very meaningful numbers, just numbers. But there is more to data than numbers. There is also sort of qualitative data Data, which is what you see when you observe what happens in the workplace, what you hear when you're conducting interviews and focus groups and roundtables. And there is also anecdotal evidence. Basically, you speak to someone who went through your training 
and they tell you a story and you realize that this story has more detail and has an edge that was not covered in the way that quantitative data was collected. So where, what I'm getting here, what I'm getting on here is that we need quantitative data, of course, we need to have the numbers, but we also need qualitative data to have the insights and to see what we are not seeing in the numbers, but what is still important. So to conduct learning evaluation in a systematic way, we need both of these kinds of data and we need to collect them in a strategic systematic way. And that's where we need some sort of a framework. So by framework, usually what is meant in the evaluation space is the Kirkpatrick model. It's not the only model. There are a lot of other models. And actually at the end of this presentation, I will refer to one model, which is a bit more granular in Kirk, uh, than Kirkpatrick, just in case you're interested and you want to dive deeper into this topic. But in this presentation, I will focus on the Kirkpatrick since it covers the very high level approach, a strategic approach to evaluation, but I will focus not on this Kirkpatrick model, but on the one on the next slide, which is the new world Kirkpatrick model. It is an updated version of the Kirkpatrick model. It is very similar to the older one. It just has a few more details. Um, it still covers four levels of evaluation, uh, which is basically strategically approaching what data you collect and what insights you want to derive from this data. Level four focuses on the results. So these are the results for the whole organization. How did the whole business or the whole nonprofit organization you work for uh, benefit? from the learning initiative, learning project, I will say training during this workshop, how did the whole organization benefit from it? Then there is level three. So what are people doing after they went through your training? How have their behaviors changed and how can we evaluate whether their behaviors have changed? And then there are levels two and one. Level two is basically after the training, what did the learners learn and what you check usually with quizzes or practical assignments. And level one is basically, did they have fun? Did they have a good time during your training? So this is a very holistic approach, starting with the business results because that's what we are aiming for and finishing with the fun and engagement part because we cannot have efficient learning if it is not engaging. So now I will dive deeper into each level. Feel free to share your insights, comments, questions anytime in the chat. Um, I can see a comment actually. It is sometimes a little hard to evaluate possible burdens and to what extent they could be avoided through training. Yeah, definitely. It is really hard to evaluate possible burdens to what extent they can be addressed through training and to what extent it is actually the trainings responsibility to address these burdens because some burdens come not from training but through operations or management so yeah there are a lot of there's a lot of nuance that's why evaluating learning is a difficult task um so level four results we'll start with the results because this is the level that the stakeholders the business the organization cares about the organization usually doesn't care whether the learners had a fun time or whether they completed quizzes the organization wants to know uh are we achieving our goals as a result of the learning? And by goals, I mean for the business, this would be either increasing profits or increasing cost savings. If I carry out a sales training, if I launch a sales training, then what is the goal of this training? Probably it is to uh, increase profits. Uh, and if I carry out, let's say, customer service training, and this customer service is not doing sales, it is only doing customer support, then my goal is to increase savings because if the customer service is more efficient we're spending more less money on customer service and our customers are happier so here we are thinking about the desired results on the very high level what do we want to achieve as an organization if you're working for a non-profit there might be other desired results of course not profits and savings but something else that is aligned with your mission some sort of kpis that you are aiming for uh, on this level roi is often brought up the ROI is return on investment, basically how much you spend on training and how much you get in return. And to evaluate ROI, of course, you need to know how much you got in return. So what are the desired results and have you achieved them? It is really tricky, though, to say that desired results, let's say increased profits, were increased due to training and not due to some other initiative or maybe a mix of initiatives that happened at the same time. Maybe um, there is a new manager 
who improved the results. Or maybe there is some sort of a new process in place that also influenced the result. So of course, at the end, when we are saying increased profits, it is very hard to say whether these profits were increased due to training. But there are a few ways to check that or at least to accommodate uh, for that. Uh, and I'll talk about them on the next slide. Anya, we have a super yeah. interesting question from Zlata. What learning, if any, doesn't need to be evaluated? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, and there is already uh, uh, the answer to this question. So <laughs> the answer. I actually think that if the participants okay. have an answer, because it is really a good question to collaborate. Uh, if any other participants have an answer, they can also unmute and share what they think about what learning doesn't need to be evaluated. I see that Yandres says that I think experiences that are there to drive building a learning culture in teams might not need an evaluation. Um, yeah, it's one answer. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I kind of tend to say that all the learning needs to be evaluated if we're talking about the learning in uh, a company in an enterprise. If we're talking about a, a learning learning that happens in a nonprofit organization, or maybe that happens as you know B two C, let's say UNICEF is delivering some sort of training or learning to a wider population in some country, there we might not be able to uh, do a full blown evaluation, and we might not capture any insights from that evaluation. So I would say that for profit organizations always need evaluation, but nonprofits not always. But that's actually my opinion. I wonder if there are any other opinions, because we have a lot of uh, experienced participants who might have insights on this. Uh, actually, in my previous company at Conto, we were measuring uh, the results of even lunch and learns, but uh -huh. only like overall satisfaction. And do you accept something to your room? Did you have fun? So like very basic level, but we were uh, measuring that uh, from events and L&D parts. Um, I, I think that even if you don't uh, explicitly evaluate this lunch and learns, you still uh, do it because uh, people talk uh, during their coffee break like, hey, that lunch was great or I hated it. And you listen and uh, make some conclusions and maybe uh, do something to improve them next time. So uh, it, it still happens even though even if we don't do it. Uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. I totally agree. And actually going back to Kirkpatrick, I think that maybe not every initiative needs to have all four levels or can have all four levels of evaluation. But this, this is actually the ideal case if you can put together all four levels in your evaluation strategy to then show the results to the business. But sometimes L1 and L2 may be just enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. If there are any more insights or comments coming, uh, we're checking the chat, uh, but for now we'll move on. So basically with this L4, L4 is the most complex one because a lot of things influence the ROI and the profits and the savings. So how do we know if the results, uh, the desired results, so the profits and savings improved due to training or due to something else? Sometimes we just don't. Sometimes there's just no way to say that the results improved due to training, but some things can be done to uh, avoid this kind of situation when we don't know. And one of them is having the evaluation strategy beforehand, before you launch the project. If you plan that you are going to have impacts on savings and then you're going to have impacts on behaviors and then you're going to achieve certain results and assessments and reactions, that helps to kind of also justify to the stakeholders that there is an evaluation strategy in place, there are certain results that you're aiming for. And if we achieve these results, this is probably due to your training. Now, evaluation strategy is not enough to pinpoint training as the root cause of the changes. Uh, if it is possible sometimes, what works well is control groups. So let's say you have, you're launching a sales training and you have two teams of sales. And if it is possible, you can administer the sales training to one team, but not to the other one. And then after the training, compare their performance. And if the performance of the team which had training improved, then Obviously, it probably happened due to your training being administered. So you can now administer it to the rest of the teams. So that is one way to show that it is training that's improving the results and not some sort of other change. Uh, 
curious if anyone used ChatGPT for trend or regression analysis. Yeah, I'll, actually, there is a way to use ChatGPT for that. There is code interpreter uh, plugin, but I'll mention that a bit later. Uh, so another way to evaluate the results of the training and ROI and figure out if it's the training that's the reason is to have both pre and post training performance assessment. So basically before the training, let's say before the sales training, you launch a quiz or you launch some sort of a practical assignment or you do a performance evaluation and you see what are the gaps and then you administer the training and you do the same post training performance assessment and you compare the results. Um, if you can combine this with having a control group, that would be ideal because then you can really say that, you know, if we compare performance of two groups, uh, one had training, one didn't. Here are the pre uh, pre training performance assessment where we see kind of the same level of performance, but then after the training we have a different level of performance. That would be an ideal showcase that it is the training that improved the performance. But if the control group is not possible, pre and post assessment having both can still be useful to say that this is the L and D function that improved the results. Um, finally, uh, if this is not possible either, it is always a good idea in your evaluation strategy to plan to collect employee insights. So basically just feedback, as Olga said, having some um, insights, whether they like learning, whether they didn't like learning, may or maybe they are using some of this learning on the job. There is just no way for the data to show that someone is using this learning on the job. So it's a good idea to plan for sort of administering surveys or doing roundtables sometime after the training, a month after the training, three months after the training, six months of the training, after the training, to have these insights coming in. And finally, yeah, trend analysis, other kinds of analysis, regression. So doing statistical analysis once you have the data that would require a bit more technical skills. But uh, as is mentioned already in the chat, as Andreas mentioned, it is a very good point. Now that we have AI, we can use uh, AI to do statistical analysis, not just bare chat GPT, of course, because it will make errors and hallucinate. But if you have, let's say, a paid subscription for chat GPT, then you can use plugins that can do statistical analysis, such as Code Interpreter, which is now like a big thing because it became available last week. And Code Interpreter is basically, you can give data to Code Interpreter and you can ask it to do analysis, just do analysis. And it will do analysis for you. It will visualize the data for you and it will help you derive insights even if you don't have statistical analysis background. So that's also an option using AI to help you in this process. And that's the level four the most complex one, the most high level one, and the most that the business cares about. But there are also lower levels. So after you know what results you want to achieve I and mean, you have defined your level four, you can start going down this ladder to the level three and you can define what behaviors you want to see on the job and these behaviors should enable your desired results so let's say your desired result is to increase profit the behavior for the salespeople would be to give more presentations to have better scores from the customers and finally to uh, close more deals so these are the behaviors that you can identify and that you can put as metrics for your training uh, in Kirkpatrick's model, this is called critical behaviors. They are absolutely necessary to achieve results. And this is an important point. They are necessary because there can be a lot of behaviors. There can be dozens of behaviors that salespeople need to show to achieve the desired increased profits. But which behaviors are necessary, not just nice to have, but absolutely necessary to achieve these results? Uh, and you can measure these behaviors through, again, having performance assessments, performance metrics, through having customer and stakeholder feedback, and through observations, self-reports, self-reflections, all sorts of quantitative and qualitative approaches. Uh, now, level three is not only about measuring behaviors, but the new Kirkpatrick's model adds a few details to it. It also adds that to achieve these critical behaviors, you need to have certain required drivers. And these are things that are necessary to enable those behaviors. This can be training and coaching, and that can feed very nicely into your strategy with launching your project. This can also be putting in place a recognition system or an accountability system. Uh, so there may, or these can be some sort of job aids uh, or maybe projects where the employees will be able to show their learned behaviors. So this is something to think about when you are putting together your evaluation strategy and the goals that you you want to achieve and the behaviors that you want to achieve, what would enable these behaviors and what 
so basically, how does your training contribute to enabling these behaviors? Is your training, if you're planning a training, necessary? Or would coaching work better? Or would mentorship work better? Or something else? Uh, and the final part of this level is on-the-job learning, which is also a new part in the Kirkpatrick's model, which is basically acknowledging that for people to change their behaviors, they need to have opportunities to apply these behaviors on the job and learn from these applications. So the behaviors don't change immediately as a result of the training. There should be opportunities to apply new behaviors, reflect on them, and apply again, uh, apply them again, and reflect on them again, and so on and so on. So this means that level three is about short-term results to a certain extent, if we're speaking about performance metrics right after the training, customer and stakeholder feedback, and so on. But this is also about planning these long-term measurements, planning long-term performance metrics assessments, planning long-term uh, feedback collection and surveys and so on. So this is level three. Then we go lower to the level four. Now we have the results, basically what we want to achieve, cost savings, profits, then we have the behaviors that will enable these results. Sales doing more presentations, writing better emails, um, showing better soft skills in communication with the customer. And then we have level two, which is more tied to your training. And this is basically when you check, so did, let's say, the salespeople acquire knowledge, skills, and attitudes that you wanted them to acquire as a result of the training? So think of quizzes, because quizzes are the most widespread example for this. Uh, at this point, at level two, you want to measure if the learners got the knowledge that you wanted them to get? Did they gain this knowledge? And this is usually measured by quizzes, but there are other ways of assessment. Did they uh, acquire the skills that you wanted them to acquire? So can they really do, when it comes to practical application, can they really do on the job what you want them to do? And finally, and I think this is an important point that Kirkpatrick also adds to his model, is that it's not only about knowledge and skills that the learners need to acquire, it is also about attitudes. So the learners should understand after the training that doing something new is worth doing it. Like, is it worth applying this to the practice? Because they might know how to do something, but they may not find it, you know, worthy to do it. So they will not even try. So attitudes is one thing. Confidence. Do they feel confident applying this on the practice? Can they do it? Do they feel they can do it, really? And finally, commitment. Will they do it? Are they committing to doing it, to applying this to practice? And if knowledge is more or less easy to evaluate because we have quizzes, we have a lot of formats for quizzes, we can do a lot of data analysis on them. Skills are a bit harder to evaluate because practical assignments are harder to evaluate and skills are more complex. Then attitudes, confidence, and commitment are the most difficult ones because someone might say that they're feeling confident or that they're finding worthy uh, the new task but do they really like there is no way except for long-term reflection tasks reflection evaluations um, discussions management feedback stakeholder feedback and so on uh, so this is the level, level two, where LMS data can be really useful. And here I'm talking more about knowledge assessment and skills assessment. And here I think uh, Olga was going to show what, uh, what we can do on Work Academy to evaluate quiz data that we get from the courses. Yeah, uh, I think uh, a lot of LMS have uh, some analytics embedded and uh, wanted to share what Work Academy can do. So regarding the quiz assessments, we have uh, several metrics. Uh, we can uh, see at the um, big analytics dashboard, one of the graphics is about uh, answered questions. Uh, this impressive number is actually a real number of uh, one of the EDERA courses uh, just for one week uh, of uh, uh, learning, people have answered this amount of questions. And we can see for, for different courses that are hosted on uh, Adara's um, Work Academy workspace. Um, and uh, we can see here the green bar and red bar. This is basically the um, 
uh, uh, the number of uh, correctly answered questions versus the number of wrong attempts. We find it a very interesting metric to measure because it shows that uh, for some courses, there, the, there is a high amount, uh, dangerously high amount of wrong attempts to answer those questions, which means that probably the question is not adequate for the target group of people that are going through this course, or maybe the content uh, is not enough to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, and this requires further analysis of, uh, of a given module or, or lecture. Then we have also for, um, we can compare for different uh, questions uh, uh, for different days through the time, how when people answered them, the average uh, attempts number and uh, the maximum uh, wrong attempts number. Yeah, so this is what, what is possible to, to check on Work Academy and maybe in different, in other LMS as well. Yeah, this is actually perfect for L2, for evaluating L2, because you have the number of correct answers here, but you also have the number of attempts that learners, basically how many times learners tried to do uh, a certain question. And I think it provides a good level of insight to an L&D professional working with this. So for example, in your left figure, if you have a a question which is performing badly. So basically you see that learners are trying to take this question and they keep getting it wrong for some reason. Um, you might want to do a deep dive uh, into that question to identify why is this question performing badly? So what is the actual reason? And on the next slide, I have uh, a very simple algorithm for doing this deep, deep dive. So basically you see in your LMS that you have a badly performing question. What next? Why could it be badly performing? There are a few reasons why it could be this way. First of all, maybe the question is too easy. So by that, I mean that a badly performing question is the one that 100% of learners always get right. This is not okay. Uh, it shouldn't work this way. If, the, if everyone gets the question right, then it means that the question is too easy, it is too obvious, and it is not testing what you want it to test, unless you're just testing whether, you know, the learners are present on the platform and they need to tick yes in your question. So maybe the question is too easy and you need to increase the difficulty of the question. But let's say you see that 100% um, 100 of, 100 of learners never get the question right. So they're always wrong for some reason and they keep trying and they keep failing. There could be two main reasons for that. One, the question is way too difficult. So maybe the content was not covered in the course or it was not covered properly or the stem of the question is confusing and difficult. So you might want to look into that and see, do you cover this content in the course? Because you're testing something that the learners are getting wrong. But then let's say you check that and you see that the content is covered in the course and now you want to test this content. So why is the question not working? It is obviously not too difficult. What else could be the reason? The main reason is probably that the question is confusing. And there are two parts of the questions that can be confusing. First of all, the question itself. So the STEM, maybe it is articulated in a way that learners can't understand it, or maybe you have a lot of um, I don't know, words that are not familiar to this audience. So there is something about the STEM that is not working. Maybe you're asking multiple questions in one STEM, so the learners are, don't know really what question to answer. So then you might want to do a deep dive into the question itself. But the other confusing part might be the answer options that you're providing the learners with. Let's say your STEM is very clear. You have only one question in the STEM. Uh, it is The question is easy to understand, but the answer options are confusing. Maybe they are way too similar and the learners don't get the difference between the answer options. Um, maybe they are irrelevant. Maybe they are all too long. Maybe you have um, just a mistake and the wrong answer option was selected on the back end of the LMS as the right one. So then you might want to dive into the answer options and look at the statistics, which answer was selected how many times. And if you see that a certain answer is being selected uh, most of the times, let's say, and this is not the right answer, then you might want to look into that answer option and see maybe there's something misleading about that specific answer option that is not useful for the learners and that's confusing them overall. So that's level two, basically quiz analysis, 
skills assessments, reflections on the attitudes, confidence, and commitment. And then we go down to level one. And level one is basically, did learners have a good time? So after we've put all this evaluation strategy together, we have the business goals. We want to increase profits. We have the behaviors. Let's say we want sales to do more presentations for a certain product. We have the quiz results and we see that sales learned what they were supposed to learn about the product from the training because we have the statistics from the LMS and we see that they are performing well on the quizzes. So at the end of the day, did they have a good time? Because if they absolutely hated this training, then they will not be committed to actually going out there and applying what they learned. It might actually be the opposite. But if they had a good time, then uh, it increases the probability that your training will work. And I think this is the level which is evaluated the most because it is the easiest to, eval to evaluate. Uh, basically, you administer feedback surveys. In these feedback surveys, you're trying to measure satisfaction, relevance, motivation, assess uh, whether the learners like the LMS, whether they like the facilitator, it was a facilitated course, and so on. So you can collect a lot of data from the feedback surveys, and you can also look into the learning engagement analytics from the LMS. So basically how the learners went through the course, how they engaged with the course, maybe there were certain points where they could not continue with the course or did not want to continue with the course. So this L1 data is still important because it tells you how learners feel about this training, but it's not as impactful as level three or level four. Um, so now with the engagement, what is helpful is of course the LMS because in the LMS you can actually see if you're administering online training, how the learners interact with the content. And Olga will show us an example how we can see that uh, in Work Academy. Yeah, so uh, some LMSs have uh, native support for this uh, feedback uh, service. Uh, we don't, but we provide seamless integration with type forms. So just by uh, uh, putting there the URL to type form, it will render nicely and uh, look as a part of uh, the Academy course. Um, and for any other types of forms, we have uh, the the code editor where you can just put the embedded uh, iframe and uh, uh, the embed any like Google uh, forms or any other forms that can be embedded through the iframe. And uh, this is how, for example, Google form looks like on the uh, right screenshots on the right screenshot. And on the next slide, we have some results. It's also the real result uh, of one uh, of the Adara courses. So you can see this impressive number of responses. It was um, data privacy course for broad target audience. And uh, these are just three um, uh, examples of questions of uh, quite an extensive feedback form. Uh, so you can see which, so the, the the very easy question, like how satisfied are you? This is what Anya was talking about. If everyone just hated the course, uh, should we continue to keep on pushing it to the students? So the um, that's the, the most um, obvious question to answer. And then there are different uh, uh, questions on demographics, uh, on satisfaction, on level of en engagement, uh, etc. Drill down through models and lectures. Um, so yeah, that's that's how it can look like. And oh. And we are approaching the end of Kirkpatrick because we already went through the, all the four levels. So at the end of the day, what do we do with the evaluation strategy? How do we put together this as a strategy? And first of all, we should start with the organization strategy. So learning happens within an organization. What goals is this organization pursuing? And how can we match our L4 to the goals of this organization? Second, how to approach evaluation strategy is to build the evaluation strategy before the learning solution is rolled out. That is an ideal case, of course, that is not always possible. Sometimes the learning solutions are out there already and you want to do some ad hoc evaluation, which is fine. But ideally, if you have the time and the resources to think through evaluation strategy beforehand, absolutely use this time for that because that is going to be very worthy at the end when you are showing the value of the project to the stakeholders and to the leaders. 
Um, start with L4, not L1, because L1 is easy. L4 is the hardest one. It is complicated. It is, yeah, there are a lot of things to feel and think about L4. Uh, and uh, include both the systematic data collection. So if you have an LMS, collect the data for the LMS, do some analysis on it, but also include qualitative data. So some points where you will be collecting learner stories, doing roundtables, doing interviews, doing follow-ups with the management to see whether your learning worked. And if you are interested in a more granular evaluation strategy, because Kirkpatrick is very high level, um, there is a newer one, which is called Learning Transfer Evaluation Model, and it is really focused on applying learnings on the job. It has many more levels than Kirkpatrick, uh, but it can be really useful, especially if you work in a big organization and you want to do a granular step-by-step -step evaluation of the learning project that you're launching. Um, I think that was it for the learning evaluation strategy. We've prepared a small gem board, a practical exercise for the participants so that you can try and put together. Yeah, Diana has sent the gem board into the chat. Uh, feel free to select your own um, basically slide in the gem board, put in your name in there, put in your email in there, and think about a project that you're working with right now and uh, how you could evaluate it. There are some examples of metrics in the gem board, but don't feel obliged to follow these examples. Rather, use them, you know, as recommendations. But feel free to use your own ones. Uh, so I'm sharing this uh, jam board screen. Uh... Uh, Anya, can, uh, maybe you, you should uh, you, you can comment on. Yeah. Um, sure. So on the top right side, we have this yellow sticker which says your name. Uh, that is if you want to use the Jamboard and you don't want to be editing the same slide as someone else. So start here with your name uh, sticker and put your name in there. Uh, below this sticker, we have your email. That is if you want us to come back to you and comment on your evaluation strategy and provide you with some feedback, feel free to put in your email there. Um, then on the left top side, we have the training title. So basically that's the name of your project for which you want to put the evaluation strategy together and one sentence about that project below. And then in the matrix, you can see that we are starting with L4, then we go L3, L2, L1. So basically think about the metrics that you could use to evaluate your project. Feel free to select from the ones that are provided here or come up with your own ones uh, and try to put together an evaluation strategy. Um, if you have any comments or insights uh, about this or questions, feel free to unmute yourself and do that because that's the collaboration part of the workshop. And uh, I've been the one doing all the talking, but I would really like us to do some more uh, teamwork and exchange. Yeah, so there are uh, 20 slides. Just uh, go through the slides and choose yours and write your name so no one steals your slide from you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, if uh, there are no questions, then I think we can start. Uh, maybe let's make it uh, like five minutes. Uh, and uh, then if we still have time, Anya can comment on some of them. Uh, if not, uh, if you type your email, you will get personalized um, comments uh, and recommendations after the, the workshop. Yeah, I'll just add that I don't have to be the only one who is commenting. So if you feel like you want to share your evaluation strategy, or you want to just comment on whatever you've heard now, feel free to do that as well.
We have one more minute. Just. <laughs> I guess that's it. Anya, should I share the, the screen with the jump, jump board for you to to comment on? Um, I would suggest that if someone wants to kind yeah. of present yeah. their evaluation strategy and discuss it together, we could do that. If someone doesn't feel comfortable doing that, that's also totally fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. We have the first slide of Kelly. Kelly, would you feel... <laughs> Comfortable if Anya comments uh, on on your strategy? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I was still typing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's something actually I'm working on right now. Can you hear me well? Yeah. 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 Good. Um, so it's actually not a simple training. This is also a question in my mind um, right now, but rather a series of enablement activities can be training can be learning path can be a workshop um, can be some peer coaching sessions and so on but the overall goal is um, in this let's say quarter to upskill the CS negotiation and upselling skills right okay. so um, we kind of I kind of went through this process already so <laughs> um, so when um, when I was supporting the um, the owner of this initiative to design the the program, we already aligned on what would be the metrics that we have to measure. So on the result level, or let's say the ultimate goal is of course to improve NRR, which is um, revenue at the end um, by certain percent um there's also some upsell and expansion target for the CS anyway. So can they hit the target um, or have they improved like if has the actual numbers um improved but after, let's say by the end of the quarter and then on behaviors level is also we have a platform that is kind of tracking or they log their activity so we can also have some data point there to see if they actually have more of this kind of conversations and opportunity identified and so on um of course also through review assessment um and then knowledge wise we have quizzes throughout the learning path and i can also imagine people will be sharing in the peer coaching session what they've learned and so far um, and, and so on and on the reaction side yeah it's typical she sets and um one thing is i was typing um the question that we ask in the survey so we have a three quarter and end of quarter uh, enablement survey so we consolidate the questions um, or the questions that we're going to ask around different enablement topics to one survey and this is also one question that i have because what i observe uh, in my experience is you know a series of um enablement events and imagine they are not only having one topic to be trained um, at each quarter it's very easily that they get kind of a survey fatigue that um if you're after every training after every um workshop to have them a survey and then ask for the feedback then very soon people are not filling out any and then we are not getting the insight that we want so what we are trying to do this time is to have a consolidated pre um yeah as i said pre-quarter post-quarter survey but at the same time then it gets to the dilemma of okay but then i can't really tell 
which exactly in those series of events are the most effective for them and um if any of this training is like not really um helping or doing what it should do so that's um kind of like a little trade-off that we have to <laughs> accept um but at this point we decide to rather have people have a more holistic view and rather do the survey than not doing the surveys so i would also like to hear from from anna um what is your take on this or your perspective or your experience so to say well first of all i love your strategy it is very data driven and metric driven um yeah and i i get your challenges with having too many surveys and basically participants getting this survey fatigue that they are not incentivized to fill out the survey anymore so i was thinking probably you have already thought about something like that actually providing well first of all keeping the surveys really short like one two questions if that's possible so that it doesn't really take much time to fill them out and second providing them with some sort of an incentive for filling out the survey uh, maybe providing them with um a badge uh which sounds funny but sometimes it works you know like providing them with a badge or giving them like a certificate of completion but only after they filled out the survey so that you know they have to fill it out in order to get the confirmation that they completed the training um yeah this sort of things but uh, i get with the survey fatigue this is very real uh but what i love about the cs because i'm also working in the cs training is that you have a lot of metrics and a lot of data. I think this is the L&D paradise because in a lot of uh, areas, we don't have as much data as we have in customer service where basically everything is measured and tracked. Yeah, I totally know that feeling. And that's one of the reasons why I changed my job because <laughs> I couldn't really measure impact um, when I previously doing like, <laughs> the Earth, like for the whole company right um i just feel like it's so hard to to justify what what i do i mean i enjoy what i do people always say it's good that we're doing something but is it really helping like to what extent is helping is very hard to measure so for me to really have the impact that is that i can kind of uh, make it more um concrete then it's easier for, for me, for myself. Um, but yeah, I think the incentive part is interesting. Um, can think about that. <laughs> well, I would have to give a lot of gifts because we have so many surveys, so many trainings. Yeah, Elena has a great comment in the chat about Carl Cup's, uh, sorry, not Carl Cup's, but Will Talharme's book, uh, which is a great book about actually surveys. Uh, so yeah, totally with you Elena maybe someone else has more insights about survey fatigue uh, and addressing it we are actually running a little bit out of time so uh, we for those who uh, whom we cannot uh, comment on your um, on your strategies now you feel free to leave your emails and we will send uh, recommendations afterwards and of course feel free to take uh, take this um, jump board with you and apply it at your work we hope it will help uh by the way lena really nice seeing you <laughs> uh, here and um yeah uh we will uh, start finalizing our uh, our session today let me just put in like i can't why uh, uh so uh okay i cannot uh for some reason canva doesn't let me to put it in full screen mode but uh, let it be like this um please uh, follow us uh work academy and adera to get insights on edtech news, on uh, learning and development overall, on uh, new courses, new technologies, and of course, updates on this event that, that we will try to make uh, more regular. Our next topics will be uh, about AI. Uh, it's a quite trendy topic, and we will uh, talk about how AI can be used in uh, training and development on workspace and not only. And and uh, then we, uh, for the next next topic, it will be about onboarding, uh, how we can use technologies to improve onboarding. And uh, yeah, so please stay with us and uh, keep uh, posted and we will be 
uh, with you. <laughs> Uh, um, Diana, I, I'm heading to you. <laughs> Please moderate. <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, super grateful for such an participation of all of you guys. I guess we had a brilliant group today and we'll be welcoming you for further events in one month. And of course, to feel free to stay in touch with us, to suggest new youth topics, drop in the comments, what are you generally interested at? And because we have a few topics in mind, but maybe in four or five months, we're gonna be running out of those. So we will gladly cover uh, something very concrete and precise you in particular are interested at. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to connect to us on LinkedIn uh, and uh, yeah, let's stay connected and make this networking uh, bigger and bigger. And uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, you can leave when you want. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for attending. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I, I guess we can switch to Google Meet. Yeah. Uh, 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 regarding the recording, yes. Uh, once we... Uh, I can stop recording. Okay. Uh, and uh, once we have this uh, recording uh, f finalized, the, the video format and so on, we will send it to all the participants.